session, what I've proposed is that from those of us who haven't heard of yet what we do, uh, that we get a short presentation on what the, uh, uh, some of these teams do. Um, as you will remember, Andy yesterday talked about the advisory groups that were set up. You saw a really recent photo of myself up there. <laughs> And um, uh, so there are three of us here, uh, Mitch, Dave, and myself, Will Struggle, and unfortunately you couldn't make it. I believe he's in Iceland somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite, uh, well, let's start with David, because you're right at the end, to, to present you know, what, uh, what your goals are with your group, uh, what you like to do, what you focus on, and what you've been doing until now. Thank you for the preparation for that, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, by the way, you gotta get a talk. <laughs> now, um, I, I lead the Partners Advisory Group and uh, our initial focus was on reestablishing or renewing the partner program uh, to something that's more workable for the partners and uh, uh, DNA Corp as well. And we launched that, uh, what, two months ago or a month ago, uh, a yeah. month and a half ago. And um, th th it seems to be well received so far. And our next uh, items on the agenda are really to look at ecosystem points, um, in, which also ties into the partner program and some other things with the community, as well as looking at the DNA marketplace and seeing what we can do with that. So those are the short-term goals. And I'd like to give a plug, if possible. For, so, so the partner program uh, has been updated in collaboration with David's group uh, and historically everybody you know just perceives that you have to sell Evoke to be a partner and that is no longer the case uh, for all the levels. So there are a lot of people in this room that own or are members of web firms who are not listed as partners. So um, I know everybody's busy and, and can't really keep up with everything but uh, we have filters. You can go and select partners by competencies, by country. Uh, so if you have not checked that out, I would uh, strongly encourage you to do so because you can get signed up as uh, a partner and increase your visibility. You want to be a virtual Will lawyer? Uh, well, yeah, I, I guess I can speak on behalf of Will Stroll, the original DNN superfan and evangelist. Um, so Will runs the uh, awareness group, and each of these groups, we, we have like reoccurring meetings. Some are weekly, some are monthly, uh, but as far as the awareness group, uh, the, the goal is to evangelize DNN, and that happens through a lot of different avenues or channels. Uh, it's writing blogs, creating videos, uh, making updates to the website. So. Uh, we have a lot of sub areas or sub tasks within the awareness group and, and some people in this room are members of that group. Uh, kind of the big ticket item that's up right now is uh, an update to dnnsoftware.com uh, and as Andy mentioned yesterday, uh, it's, it's no longer like an evoke uh, specific homepage. Uh, but the updates that we're discussing in the awareness group now are kind of more significant. Uh, in the information architecture and design and you know promoting the, the community so um, we would love to have anybody uh, join the awareness group uh, if you've been seeing a lot more blogs even blogs in Spanish where's Francisco at? He, that, that area. so um, w you know these these blogs and translations are results of uh, things that are going on in the awareness group so uh, if you're not active we, we would love for you to get involved all right, I'm, uh, I'm in charge of the technology group. Um, Daniel created a, a bit of a poster to kind of show some of the, um, the, the short-term goals of what we're working on right now. Um, I've been the lead of the group only for a couple of weeks, um, stepping in just because I have a little bit more time available um, than what Sean uh, Walker had. Um, right now, our immediate goals um, are the three things that we have here on the poster. Um, community, really, in terms of taking you know, control and starting to set the direction of what we're working with in terms of how we do releases on platform. So that's community-driven roadmap. Um, being able to decide what we're gonna get in those releases, how those are gonna work. Um, we're still working through some of the logistical things to get that all ironed out. 
It's one of the things that you know uh, Andy and Ash and I are going to be chatting about later on today to continue to get some of that stuff working out. We're also working actively to get um, some build and release processes put in place. Um, those of you that have done pull requests may have uh, noticed recently we're getting automated builds um, set up so that every time you do a pull request there's an automated build to start getting some gates in place to make the pull request process more reliable and more consistent. Um, there's still some areas to, to really focus on there, um, but uh, we're working to improve that. And then with that, um, getting the community contribution things solidified. So we have been working on, the, in the last couple of weeks, a, a new pull request process that is mutually agreed upon by everybody in terms of how we will review contributions, how we will accept those contributions, and what we're expecting. Um, so from a, an immediate term perspective, it's really taking care of, you know, if you will, the handing over of things to allow the community to take, you know, a more concerned effort to drive forward. The longer term goals of the group, the things that we're talking about now are cleaning up the APIs, being able to reduce the footprint if we can, um, whatever we need to do to start moving the technology forward, ultimate goal being getting to .NET Core and doing the things necessary to get there. Um, but making sure that we take a methodical approach, take into consideration all of the things that may impact what we do, such as do we need to upgrade, do we need a migration path, how do we go about doing that, what is the real scope of effort um, to do that. So those are the conversations. Our group is meeting on a weekly basis. Um, we have um, a number of people that are attending on a regular basis if you're interested. Um, we definitely, you know, we're actively looking for individuals to help. Um, we should start seeing much more momentum. Uh, there's draft roadmaps. Um, I don't think Oliver's published it yet. Not yet. I don't think um, so. But there was a meeting that happened this, this week, actually, while I've been traveling, uh, where we're starting to look at, you know, even just getting maintenance releases, getting to a consistent release process where we release on a regular basis, even if we're only releasing fixes, so that we have the continued release process relevancy, so people don't see, well, we had a release, and then, oh yeah, there was supposed to be one, and first quarter, but it didn't happen, right? We don't want to get to that point. We want to get to where there's consistency, where the people that are looking at the platform see we have regular releases happening. Um, so that's what we're working on now, where we're trying to go. Um, Definitely, you know, reach out if you want to get involved, etc. Um, for me, it's developers, 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 right? Oh, Steve Ballmer, quoting throw it here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I identified uh, three areas of focus uh, for the developers group, um, which is one is documentation. So we obviously. Uh, this is a recurring theme. I mean, documentation is, of course, never finished. Uh, it's always an ongoing process. Um, there have been various iterations of the documentation process of, um, of DNN. Um, the most recent is docs.dnsoftware.com. Um, and uh, I put it this way, it's, it, it's always a, um, a controversial subject. There are people who love it, people who hate it, etc. There's a lot of people that tend to be very opinionated about it. Um, and uh, so I think that's definitely one area of focus, of course, for bringing in new developers. Uh, the other is tooling. So in terms of tooling, you must think about um, you know, build tools for your modules, build packaging stuff and um, templates, you know, templating tools that, you know, start to, or scaffolding tools, if you like, scaffold out uh, a new module, a new skin, whatever. Uh, that is um, part of a tool set that the more seasoned developers in DNN will have their own stuff, or at least I do. I don't know if you guys just reinvent the wheel every time, but, you know, you get your tooling sorted. And the other is awareness. Um, so, it's, it's f because it kind of overlaps, of course, with what uh, Will Stroll uh, does, but specifically for developers, um, it's important to have content out on YouTube about uh, DNN. Um, so, this conference, we have we're taking video to a whole new level. We're going to have 
all presentations filmed and put online. That provides us with a whole bunch of, you know, like 30, 40, 40 hours of DNN content that's going to be streamed to, uh, to YouTube. So I'm very excited about that. Um, what's happening? Well, just alluded to that. Uh, in terms of the documentation, uh, Kelly Ford has stepped forward to lead that part, like he's, uh, um, we're actively uh, working on a solution based on a static site generation type tool where <coughs> we can have markdown uh, files in GitHub that anyone can, you know, put pull requests against and we push the button and we have a new documentation up. Uh, so that's the technical side of it. Now the content side, of course, is uh, at the same time, you know, we're, we're looking left and right, like, okay, so who would be willing to contribute uh, content to this? Uh, we're looking to intelligently migrate what is there uh, into this solution as well. But still early days, uh, we're also meeting weekly for that uh, uh, project. Um, so that's already two weeknights that I uh, see my friends online. Um, uh, then, uh, in terms of tooling, um, it's Matt Rutledge, Rutledge. Mm -hmm. who is working on Yeoman uh, templates. Uh, anyone heard of Yeoman? It's a great way to scaffold out uh, some, some, uh, you know, your project to start with. Anyway. So he's working on that. Uh, that's an ongoing effort, and uh, as I said, the awareness we're we're videoing this. So that's our our focus for the developer group. Um, then I'd like to ask uh, the corp employees that we haven't heard from yet about their role in corp. Um, so I'm Clint Patterson. I, I mean, I know a lot of you. There's a lot of you that I know your faces, but I haven't met you in person yet. I'm ecosystem manager. Uh, and I view that as kind of the bridge in between the community and Corp. So I am involved in a lot of different areas, uh, the DNN store, all of the ecosystem advisory groups, uh, the MVP program, anybody who has a problem emails me and I chase uh, a lot of rabbits and put out a lot of fires. So uh, that's what I do. <laughs> Sounds good. My name is Ash Prasad. I'm currently VP of product at DNN Corp. Uh, I know many of you. I've been with DNN for now, I think, uh, over seven and a half years. Uh, primarily, uh, I was focusing on engineering prior to the acquisition. Uh, now I'm looking into primarily the roadmap for DNN as to what we're going to be building this quarter, the next quarter, the next year. And also working very close with the community leaders to make sure that we're able to kind of transition the, the open source part uh, so that they have more independence and, and they can work uh, independently and decide on the roadmaps and things like that. But at the same time, maintaining the integrity of the platform, make sure that it continues to be solid, continues to have the same standards or even better standards of quality that we had with the core. Uh, so, so working with that as well. So, so that's my role. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you did something I, as well, I believe. I, 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 think, I think I just sit around, basically, and drink coffee and have fun. So. <laughs> All right, having said that, I think, so you know uh, what hat we wear here uh, at the table, and so I'd like to open the floor up for questions about, you know, DNN, the process, how, uh, how you can get involved, uh, what nags you, what keeps you up at night. Um, <laughs> Um, please. Well, yeah. Yeah, there have been a lot of changes here in the last. <laughs> yeah, I, will, I will repeat the question. Okay. I will repeat the question. Okay, so my question is uh, Is there any change uh, related to how the security issues are handled? Who is handling that? Uh, do we need to change something from our side? How things will go? The question, in case you didn't hear it, is um, are there any changes to the way security is handled? Uh, who do we contact? Uh, who, who, is, who is currently uh, behind the, uh, uh, the red, red phone, right? Uh, at DNA Corp. I can answer that. So there is an email that, that hasn't changed and that won't change. It's called security at dnnsoftware.com. 
and you send an email and that gets monitored by people inside DNN. But now with the transition uh, to, uh, to, the, to the platform, giving more control to the platform, we're actually working with the platform to invite more people into that group. Uh, it has to be very specific individuals because sometimes some of the reports that we get is very specific and they are very targeted about a site. And so we want to make sure there could be some sensitive information. So we want to make sure that the person or persons that join that, that group has that kind of in integrity that, uh, that information remain confidential. So we are going to be actually expanding that group and working with the community. There was a time when community was involved a uh, long time back in that the same email and, and people from, I think it was Brandon. Yeah, hey, yeah Brandon, Hayes. Hayes. Brandon Hayes, Hayes, right? So, yeah. uh, but, but I think he tapered off or, or yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, himself. So then it was Corp was doing all of that, but uh, it's still a prime uh, area for us. Be being an open source, we get a lot of reports. A uh, lot of uh, repeated reports, I'll tell you that. And you know, many people say that, hey, I have this problem in 8.0. And uh, you know, most likely it's already fixed, so we don't actually go and, and say that we'll give you a patch or anything. But we do point them to uh, security bulletins that we continue to release. Uh, we do blog about it. We can't disclose a whole lot about the vulnerability just because the, the sensitivity of that, uh, that thing. And uh, I'll also, also tell you that we do get some researchers who, uh, who send us a report ahead of time, and they also give you a timeline. Hey, if you don't fix it, uh, two months or three months in this hackathon or whatever, okay. they're going to talk about it, how to hack DNN. So it's very s important uh, matter for us because DNN and you know, open source and Microsoft, it, you know, it's, if you are able to find a vulnerability, it's a pretty good thing for their research, right? It, go, it gives credibility to, to them, but they give, give us heads up and we work and we do a fix and when we do a patch or whatever, do a release. And uh, so, yeah. So every, everyone in here is familiar with security at uh, dnnsoftware.com, dnnsoftware right? You find anything, you doubt anything that you've seen, it's security at dnnsoftware.com. So and then you trigger the process. Right, and it's not an email per se. I mean, it's a Zendesk ticketing system. So right. we have a proper ticket. You get a response that, hey, you've got a ticket ID, right. and it's properly tracked. And we, whether we close it, not close it, what we do, it's not, it just doesn't go into one person's inbox. It's very well managed. Yeah, and, and I would just add to just as we've transitioned the um, where you submit, you know, requests and things like that, you know, from the old DNN tracker Jira over to GitHub, security issues should never be logged as issues in GitHub. Yeah. Um, just again because of the privacy aspect of what that issue is. So for those of you that weren't familiar with the security email. Just make sure to remember anything security related should not be logged in the public issue tracker. Okay. Yes, I, I have some questions about the DNS store. So I remember that uh, at the first uh, virtual conference and we talked about the loading the fees and the revamping the store. And I know I'm in the partner uh, advisory group, and I know we talked about this, and I think there was also an offer, uh, uh, a budget estimation for how long is it going to pay. So I, want, I was wondering if a decision has been made or what's the following decision? Sure. So the, so the question was, because uh, we're recording this also, so the yeah. question was, is, hey, what's going on with the store? And I thought the fees were, A, I thought it was going to be revamped, and B, I thought the, uh, um, the, the, the actual store needs to get better. And I, I totally agree. Uh, and I, I'm actually not holding up the decision. <laughs> so, uh, and just like I mentioned yesterday, uh, we aren't intending to monetize the store, right? I mean, there's a lot of companies like Apple and others that, you know, they want to grow the store to be able to take their pound of flesh out of that, and that is definitely not the case here. So uh, there were two parts of the, to the discussion. One was actually lowering the fees, which uh, I don't know where that actually stands, but you know I'm, I'm happy to do that whenever, uh, as long as we have the right uh, plan in place. Uh, but then two, uh, I think that there was also, we were looking at the, uh, what do we replace it with? There was a couple of different versions of stores that are out there that we can either plug in or we can drive um, the, 
um, the replacement on and what have you. So I, I don't know what the, what the latest is, but there's nothing on my end that, that's keeping us from doing that, and I think that we should, so that we make it so that there, because I know, again, there are a lot of people that have modules that they don't put on the store for that reason, right? Um, now, I am a fan of having a segmented store, uh, because unfortunately, if you have a, a store that is just, rela just relying on marketplace dynamics, on ratings, you have to have people that have a bad experience to rate that particular module or something low to understand the, the quality of it. So I, I do see at some point a segmented model where, hey, here, here's perhaps higher end modules that have been through some type of QA validation uh, that's perhaps intended for larger businesses or whatever else it may be, and then kind of the, the general store related to it. But, um, but Clint, do you know what, uh, what the latest is on, on that? No, I mean, I think that would I, I think we're going to reopen those conversations here pretty soon uh, in the partner group and kind of come up with a game plan that we can really get some definitive action plans in place. Yeah, so, but, but I'm, I'm all for it, for sure. Uh, what about knowing if you want to plug the plans needs to be put in place? What are the plans that you need to put in place? Yeah, well, there's um, the first part needs to be, uh, uh, the question was, uh, what about lowering the fees? Um, the first part is, is what is the cost structure around the store uh, to make sure that it's cost neutral? All right, and then that, that depends on, well, what costs are going to be there if we license uh, a new storefront, for example, what does that actually need to be and things like that. So I think the first decision needs to be, what, what are we going to do with the actual infrastructure around the store itself? And what does that cost? And then, and then what volume of transactions actually need to occur in there to make sure that that pays for it, right? Because we're still happy to, I guess, um, help with the store as far as the, uh, the, the payment models and ensuring all that's all set up appropriately on the right servers and things like that. Um, but we need to make a decision on, on what the underlying software needs to be to understand what the, what the costs are there. So it feels like an AP. Is going to be on the uh, well, ideally, so the question is, is it going to be on the corp side or the um, uh, on the overall platform side? I, 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 ideally, there, there is no delineation between the two, right? Where, um, in, in my mind, uh, the dnnsoftware.com should be a community site as a whole. Uh, and that's why we changed the home page to reflect that a bit more. And then Will and crew have some roadmaps to make it even, even more so. But I want to, again, just change it to... Um, just the, the simple stuff <clears throat> out of the shoe <clears throat> so that it is uh, more community focused. And then I, I view the same thing with the store where it's just kind of a pull down menu on, hey, here are the things that are evoke uh, related and then here are the things that are platform related and you can just choose between them. You know, similar to say an iPhone versus an iPad version. Yeah, but I guess I was referring more like the administration of the store. Like the implementation, maybe the community has that. Like sure. Implemented, but the administration that needs to be like full time yeah, no, so I believe that the administration in the near term will still continue to be done by the corp side uh, because there's, uh, you know, there's uh, tr transactions on the, the payments to ensure that they're, uh, they're done and, and what have you. But then the, the support element of it actually ends up being uh, whoever submitted the module and things like that. So it ends up being a partnership model. Um, but I guess we'll see long term whether or not it's a, a, a full community. Uh, driven approach or whether or not if the if corp is still needed in there but in the near term just to make sure that it gets done and gets in put in put in place I think that will continue to monitor it. Interesting. Um, how about the roadmap? Um, it's currently 9.3 is uh, scheduled for a third quarter. I think a lot of us, at least I am, really waiting for uh, an update on version 9 that's um, usable and Maybe you want to go from A to 9, uh, which is not the case until yet. There's a lot of UX issues. I think there are some uh, GPR issues. Um, I think we're waiting for the next step, and maybe quarter 3 a little bit late. And historically, Q3 will mean in reality Q4-ish. Sounds a bit skeptical, but that was reality. I'll just re repeat the question for him. <coughs> so the question is, um, you know, what's up with the with the roadmap? Uh, isn't quarter three uh, out a bit far uh, for us? We'd love to have an update on DNN nine um, that is usable, right? That works. <laughs> and <laughs> no sarcasm intended at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Uh, so, yeah, address it, basically addressing uh, a number of uh, grievances that the community have expressed, uh, if I put it in more neutral terms, uh, about DNN 9 and potentially the persona bar solution that is in DNN 9. Um, so, Mitch. Yeah, so there's, there's been a there's been a couple of zigzags in terms of exactly how things are going. Um, you know, I've got a talk about GDPR this afternoon that was supposed to be about new features that were supposed to be here for this week. Yeah. Um, due to some things and getting all of this logistical stuff happened, you know, squared away, that didn't happen. Um, I'm trying to figure out and we're trying to work to fix the communication issues that resulted in that happening. Um, the, this week, um, a roadmap discussion was had um, focusing on getting a release out fairly soon. Um, I don't want to commit to a date yet because we, we are still finishing a couple of things, but the, the discussion at this point is to get a 921 release out with bug fixes in the near term and then possibly move on to a 922 that's additional bug fixes along the way. Um, we are going to be looking from a GDPR perspective, we have a certain number of features that have been spec'd out now um, due to all of the aforementioned stuff. Um, we're looking for some community contributions. My talk this afternoon about GDPR, um, we can go into a lot more detail about what we're looking for and, and what we might need from a community contributions perspective to get that feature out. Um, the, the plan for the GDPR items in terms of getting them incorporated into the platform um, is really going to be as soon as we can get them contributed and as soon as we can get those features validated once they've been contributed um, into, into that release. Going forward, there's plans to work on getting the roadmap more <coughs> solidly defined, um, but the overarching concept right now at a minimum is rather than doing a release and then waiting months and months and months, to address those grievances, those little things, um, to at minimum get to a point where we have a very regular bug fix release. Um, but what I want to make sure of before we say anything is I don't want to publish a roadmap that says we're releasing in June and then June comes, we still don't have you know a bunch of things organized and then it becomes a July release or an August release or a September release. So we should be able to tighten that down a lot more in the coming weeks. Uh, there's definitely the intention for stepping stones. And yep. two, if I advise it, uh, what I'm hearing is that even very critical issues like GPR are uh, depending on the community contributions. Is that right? Our, our uh, GDPR, like critical aspects, like for instance GDPR, uh, dependent on uh, community contributions is the question. And at that point in time, yes, that is now the way that we are working with that. What would you suggest us to do? You plan the DNA upgrades to 9.2 uh, for our clients, and it's a lot of work. And clients have to test and so it's really a, a project we have to plan in advance. Um, would you suggest to skip it and wait until um, or to do it now and then? Uh, because I don't want uh, to uh, do it. Uh, yeah, so the question is do we, uh, I'm faced with upgrades uh, to DNN 9.2 should I hold off or not, given uh, everything that you're lining up for 9.3, because I don't want to update twice? Um, the short answer right now, unfortunately, is you should upgrade. Um, the number of security items that have been addressed, especially if you're anything prior to 9, you know, even if you're 9.1, there's, Ash, I believe it's Yeah, they're all the security, so our recommendation is always upgrade. Now, after 9.2 and the maintenance releases, uh, they should not be as disruptive. So 9.2 could have been a disruptive release, but you should get to that baseline. And once you do that, after that, it should be incremental updates, right? I mean, it will still be a full upgrade, but it should not be that hard. Yeah. So even GDPR shouldn't be that hard. I mean, an upgrade is a pretty good. Now and do it again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
small do another one, right? It should yeah. be just slap on to that. It shouldn't be a you know your UI breaking or something like that or API breaking. And and to to extend upon that a little bit, right? For those that haven't looked a lot of detail into what happened with 9.2, right? The main reason why 9.2 is so complicated is there was a large amount of code that was removed. Um, in terms of old stuff that had been around, you know, we weren't supposed to be using anymore. Um, a lot of us were still using some of that stuff because it was the faster way of doing things, et cetera. Um, the one thing that we are working on in the technology group is to put a much more solid process around prior notification that this stuff is going to be removed and also pairing the release numbers of things that are major breaking changes to be more apparent. So rather than a 9.2 release that for our, my personal experience, less than 50% of the sites have been able to upgrade successfully. Yeah. Um, and that's not acceptable in my opinion that a dot two release right. introduce that kind of a break. Yeah. So what we're looking at doing is establishing a better process where that's something that could happen with a 10 release, but it really forced a very negative hand because you do need to upgrade to 9.2 because of security. But upgrading to 9.2 is probably the most painful upgrade we've had since 6. And 6 was bad. So from a, a community perspective, you know, we, we definitely see it. Yeah. Just a bit of encouragement for you. <coughs> yeah. And, and so we really do want to make sure Right, that it's there. There's, there's some things, and for those of you that have done it, um, there's, I mean, I know between David and myself and, and Daniel, you've got a lot of people here that have done a lot of 9.2 upgrades, um, some successfully, some with a lot of workarounds. But if you're concerned about it or if you've ran into troubles, catch one of us and, and we'll gladly try to point you in the right direction because it, it is painful. Um, and we're gonna try to do everything we can we can't fix the pain. I mean, there will be, there will be things that break going forward, yeah. right? If you're using old modules and if they're doing old things, we have to evolve that platform. But what we want to do is make it a little bit more transparent of be prepared. This is coming. Right. But also, and, and to, to add to that, I think also, if it's your own modules that are breaking, you need to look at your own internal process indeed for for the module program. Is other people's modules breaking? Okay, then you obviously have someone to send an angry email to. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about these things that possibly could break and that you've been doing some work on that. Shouldn't that be much more fully documented and visible somewhere else? So that people should not be knocking at your door? So the question, question is, shouldn't this be more visible? And, and I think we just alluded to that point earlier. Yeah, yeah, and so one of the things, we were talking about this yesterday, and I actually need to follow up with you about this later, but at minimum, we removed you know, 200 API methods as part of the 9.2 release. Right. The release notes at minimum should have said, here's what was removed. It's not gonna fix that pain as much, for the non-developer related, right. um, but at least for the developer related, it's gonna give you an idea. Um, I welcome ideas from the community, especially into the technology group, as we talk about <coughs> these sorts of things. What I can tell you right now, we don't have a good process in place on how we're going to remove some of this stuff. We are not removing that stuff until we have a better communication plan. My question is maybe, maybe in a different way, but you're saying that People should move to nine. Mm -hmm. and it's difficult. So why don't? Is that a priority in one of those groups to make people transitions to nine to much easier? So then we get more. There, to nine two. Okay. So so can we make it easier for them to transition to nine two? Um, even even if it's just documentation and blog posts that are clear there. So that that's yeah. The, 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 so that the pain is not so hard. Right. So. There, there definitely, you know, how, how do we clear that pain, right, is, is, the, is the real question. And, and unfortunately, right, um, the, the break that happens in 9.2 upgrades is not DNN platform. The break in a 9.2 upgrade isn't a vote. Um, the problem is, is it's third-party modules, it is custom modules, 
that were using code that had been flagged for years as we shouldn't do this, right? We've built, as my company, over 700 modules over the years. I didn't even realize that we were using some of the really old school ways of doing it because that coding style was easier. So unfortunately, it's not as clear as just writing a blog post on how to do it. There are some things you can do, right, to make sure you're better, right? Check for module upgrades beforehand and that kind of stuff, which I think we, we could definitely blog about that. You know, check with your module vendors and upgrade, uninstall modules that you're not using, do all of that stuff beforehand. Um, but to truly ease the pain, um, sometimes it just takes time. I mean, Daniel, you just said it took you how long until you were yeah, So I'd like to add on that. I think, the, for example, we were never hit by internal API problems, but the zip library, anything that uses zip, yep. Yeah. Anything that uses JSON is screwed. And anything that, if you, if you have certain things with the client dependency framework, there are some incompatibilities. But I think zip, zip is the worst. Zip is the worst, yeah. And JSON was pretty bad. Yeah. And for zip, we actually found a solution that we could inc inc include in the next release that would actually make it disappear, the problem. Um, so we'll look at that. And for everything else, the problem is really that since DNN 9.2 came out, people immediately started using it. And that means there was no time for the vendors to prepare for that. So of course I would get bad ratings on my modules because people would say, hey, I installed it and it doesn't work, it sucks, here's one star, thank you. One thing yes. I can add is that you know, we, we actually publish nightly builds every day. So I think we encourage the community to go check out and test your modules while the software is in development. That is and, useless. But if I have yeah. to test it for six months on every nightly build to then finally get hit one day, that is not right. realistic. Well, no, and, and I, that, brings up that, a very, that, that brings up a very valid point, right? One of the things that we're talking about in the technology group and one of the things that I hope to get addressed literally within a couple hours after this conversation is getting to a scenario where we were five years ago, where we would do, a release would be ready, it would be released as a release candidate. It's at that phase that all of our module vendors would have time. You, as site owners, we would still encourage you to try those upgrades, right, and to validate everything. But we would give the module vendors time, right? Whether that is, is two weeks or four weeks, I think it's gonna depend on the type of release. I think the minimum is two weeks. I think for a release like a 9.2 with breaking changes, we'd want to give almost four weeks just to give these developers time. But I think if we can change that process as a community, because um, I agree with Daniel, um, nightly builds, I don't look at them. Um, I look at the builds as they're coming in and pull requests and those kinds of things, but I'm not gonna pull down a nightly build and, and try. A release candidate for our commercial stuff, definitely. So I believe that Throughout all of this, we're going to make it better going forward. Um, unfortunately, 9.2 is something that happened, and we're going to have to deal with it as a community and make sure we never do it again. Yeah. And I'm kind of a big fan. Put, oh, sorry, I was going to say, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of the RC to PV process. Yep. I think Microsoft does that pretty well when, when you look at the drivers and the whole linear. So uh, we should be following the same. I was going to say, could you use kind of the store where mod most modules are downloaded from anyways and have the module provider verify back that, hey, we verified our module the, the next release, so there's a visual, so you don't get the customer that downloads it and then gives them a one star? I think that's a great, do you want to repeat the question, if yeah. you were? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I get, yeah. So the, <laughs> JR's uh, JR's question. <laughs> don't, don't worry, I'm, I'm going to get him back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> JR's question was: uh, it, it couldn't it be some type of a, uh, a validation system where the module vendor is approved, um, you know, that they validated uh, with that particular RC uh, before it's available? And, and I love that uh, model too, so that uh, so that the end customers um, they don't have to discover it on their own and then you know, do a, a, a one star or, or just have a bad experience. And I think it's a, it's a great process. And I think that that should be incorporated into not only the release process, but then also the, sto the new store uh, process that we were talking about, right? Where 
Um, you don't want to have a store that you know that that isn't well validated uh, and doesn't work, right? And uh, people have to figure it out that way. So I think it's a great suggestion, Jerry. I would say also, the, I mean, best practices, and a lot of module vendors do this already, but they'll put what versions are supported in their description. Unfortunately, there's no you know structured way to do that within the store right now. Uh, for them to indicate specific release levels and all that, but it is considered a best practice to state what versions your module supports. And, and you, you wouldn't want to trust the module vendor to say, yeah, mine works in nine, whatever, because they would all just say it. And the truth is there, there's thousands of modules on the store. Some vendors are very active, some are not. And so it would need to be automated, like maybe we're talking about open sourcing the, the EVS system. It would be great if EVS could scan modules and tell you what version. Uh, but implementing that in reality would require a lot of man hours. And, and you would have tons of communication that were, there would be no response from vendors. Yeah, well, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right there's, there's, there's another part to this discussion of breaking APIs, and that is that within the, the dev group, uh, we now have um, API documentation to keep track of methods when they get deprecated and when they get actually removed from the code. Um, so there, there, is all, there are also you know, other parallel efforts going on to, to help developers avoid the kind of pain that you guys are experiencing with these kind of updates. I'd like to go to a question of Jan. Uh, um, uh, just a comment on the release thing. Yeah. I think transparency is the key here. And I would recommend uh, just use a semantic versioning system so that you have a yeah. major, minor patch version. Absolutely. And never okay. break something when you just increase um, a minor version. Absolutely. Like now with 9.1 to 9.2, I think updates are always good. And sometimes you have, break, you have to break things. Yeah. Um, we had problems with the old SID library for years because the old one was very buggy. Yeah. So I was really happy to see the change in the 92. But of course, a lot of people uh, uh, face problems with the update. Yeah. I, but on the other side, I would never call or name this version the 92. It's then a 10 release. Yeah. And then it's totally Absolutely. clear from the, from the version number what the client has to expect from an update. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, the version numbers more or less saying nothing. Maybe yeah. the, the patch version, something, then you know, okay, it could be a patch, but there is no information behind this version number. It could be also named 10.0. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so okay. at the moment, I don't know. I yeah, can but this, not, yeah. Um, not a, yeah, yeah so that's exactly where we're going, yeah. right? That's, that's the, that is the current roadmap plan, is yeah. to really make it apparent. Well, the release <laughs> Then, if you release a new major version, like you, you, you release a 10 version. Yeah, yeah no, it, it, it's, 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 it's exactly the, this whole semantic uh, numbering system is something indeed that. Uh, we will be doing that. Going we will forward. be doing that. Just last comment. Then you can have another release process. For example, for a 10 version, then I need the release candidate. But mm -hmm. maybe for a 9, yeah. 2, 1, 9, 2, 2, I don't need a release candidate because it's nope. just. There will always be a release candidate. I, I, one of the things that I think from a community, just to expand on this a little bit, is this is one of the areas we've gotten tripped up on some stuff. When we set a process, from a community perspective, we need to make sure we're consistent across the board. I think a, a 10 release or a, an 11 release, a slightly longer period for a release candidate, but we will, I think, always do a release candidate. And the reason behind it is we can make our best efforts Right, to not break something in a point release, there is always a chance, even with the most minute bug fix, right, that we could break something. So I don't, the process should be the same, but you should be aware of what the risk is based on the semantic versioning. And that's where we're trying to get to consistency. Always processing community pull requests the same way. The same standards for a release, the same standards for documentation to make it that quality. Release candidates never a bad thing. Right. Always helps. Yeah. But on the other side, you have to make sure that you don't lose um, efficiency and speed. So for example, maybe for a major release, you need release candidate for, let's say, four weeks. But if I only roll out a patch version because it's something urgent or pretty good bug or whatever, then maybe you need a release candidate for, for right. only two, two exactly. days. Just yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I can move to Arch Peter. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I agree. Yeah, first of all, I want to make a compliment about the new partner program. I'm very happy with the new partners. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy with the new rules and requirements, and I would suggest anybody here who does anything professionally for his business, personally, or his company to become a partner. I like to have competitors. Mm -hmm. They are small, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> EPT, maybe we, should, maybe we should poll the audience to say how many people are listed in the partner directory. Yes, yeah, good question. Yeah. How many people have we Not seen? enough. No, no, no. Please register yourself as a partner. The requirements are quite, quite simple, easy. It will take you some time to get the material ready. But the more partners are registered, the better it is. And if there are a thousand partners in three years, they're probably going to produce some new requirements for different levels. But I would be happy if I would be 100 to 150 different partners all yeah. over the place. Because Great. we lost a number of time. The deals cost other products that a number of partners in our business. <coughs> Whereas for a DNN, there were only one or two or three. But that's, we were better than the other products, I think. I know. Yeah. But there are 30 partners for Sidecore, and, and the, the companies choose Sidecore because there were more partners. So register yourself, it doesn't cost anything anymore. If there's some feedback and suggestibility, please do so. Some other things. You talked about the blog post in Spanish. Can I do it in Dutch as well? What's stopping you from doing it? <laughs> the requirements up front, before, so I'm doing it in Dutch. Right. Anybody who wants to blog, okay. it can blog. It, it's, yeah, I, just, I just check a box and it happens. Maybe you want to check what I'm writing down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, certain people will do review, yeah. like for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also, we gave a presentation yesterday about language uh, translations and it would, would uh, uh, Ask people who are from the non-standard DNN languages to start using the uh, DNN Connect translation module on DNN Connect or so we get translated modules or the core in non-standard core languages as well. Yeah. The Ukraine, uh, uh, Russian uh, translation, excellent, but you can use much more type of translation so you can produce and, and, and make your installation happy for the. 25 different languages. Is it, we, do, we could do another poll. Is there anyone here for whom uh, in their language there's no language pack, uh, core language pack? I'm looking for some. Uh, yep, yeah, there you go, Romania. Yeah. You just volunteer. Farsi. 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 Well, I think it's Croatia. It's not only for the core, any kind of module or store. We can make it yep. available on the page on the exactly. Connect site and you can produce translations there. It doesn't have to be 100% complete. Yeah. Even 5 or 10% of the user interface to the end user would help to make this particular module more profitable for all of us in the exactly. community as well as our clients, which is the most important part. Yeah. There's a question about uh, uh, security. Uh, uh, I think about four or five years back, uh, uh, DNN Core produced for one of the community members the OS, OWASP, yeah. 10 hit points uh, uh, comparison. There has been a new 10 main points in OWASP requirements. They mixed up a little bit. Is there anything about security and the connection to DNN in that environment, in that situation? Because okay. for commune, for, for, for government or large scale companies, it really helps. Uh, the uh, 2013 was 10 points out of 10, which is great. 2017 um, has six hundred still there, but for new ones. Yeah, so. Help it if there's somebody who wants to do that. Yes, I think there's Hold on, can question. Peter repeat that? Oh, for yeah. yeah, no, no, I think. <laughs> no, actually, here, I'll, I'll repeat the question. So, oh, oh, ask. <laughs> Updating the, the community for OWASP Top 10, um, the 2017 release is different than the prior 2013. Um, right now, in looking at what they've shifted, um, DNN meets most of the requirements. Um, to the letter of the requirement, you're mostly okay. There are a couple features, mostly around what they call broken access control, um, or 
a couple of things around user authentication that we can't do um, in terms of suggestions. I um, mean, it's only in the suggestions that we don't meet that requirement. So we've seen reviews against the OS top 10 that say we're still okay. Um, there is definitely some areas of improvement. The biggest things right now, um, and these would be fantastic things from, from a community perspective um, that we could rally around to, to get done, um, is we don't have a way of doing a stop list of passwords. So um, by they're recommending now in the 2017 version to have a list of known <coughs> common passwords and don't allow your users to set them. We don't have that capability. Um, there's also a uh, recommendation in there around um, some retention policies of passwords, which we don't really have easy support. Those are really the two biggest things. I mean, they jockeyed around a couple things, um, but most of the big change um, actually falls back on the site administrators, um, where it's the patching. So one of the OS top 10s would be not upgrading to 9.2, not applying the Telerik fixes, not having security analyzer installed, um, those kinds of things. That was the big shift that moved up to, I believe, number eight um, on their list where it was off before. Um, I, I do think it would make a great blog post to run through that. I've got some slides on it. I can try to see if I can get it or get the information to somebody else to get it out there. Okay. So more reports in here. I would like to get some support for the modules that are either on the DNM community, GitHub organization, or support for the DNM Connect modules on GitHub, because some of the breaking changes from now too were based on the fact that those, let's say, community modules or core modules are not maintained one way or the other. And if there are people around who are willing to spend one or two hours fixing some of the problem and we have to assist. If you don't know how to use GitHub, I'm happy to assist you. Give me 25 minutes and I'll learn you the basics. I've done that four years in Rome now, and every year one of the persons uh, converted to GitHub, so I would really love to do that. And the last question I have uh, is the possibility to have those DNM community or DNM connect GitHub module also automatically listed in the store. You don't know how much work it is to put a module in the store. I've done it for one or two uh, community modules. Uh, but it would be easy if those modules that are as releases available on GitHub would be available in the store That's as well. Idea. If you look at other CMS or the source system, there's a whole bunch of free modules or, or paid, paid modules. And it would help if, if the visibility of the community efforts made in there is available and visible in the store. Yeah, now, I'm, I'm a fan of that, uh, be, make sure that it's available in the store also. So um, as we revamp the store, we should absolutely do that. So I agree with you. <laughs> Last question still. When is your, <laughs> when is your prime program available for a game and connect uh, platinum support contract? Because I find it very interesting for clients opting in for the platinum support, or whatever you want to call it, that they will be able to use other products in your listing of available products in it. I think it, it, for larger clients, it would be very worthwhile if they could step in for one product and have the availability of free use of other products in your prime offering. So I'm really looking forward to, I've seen that you've done it for yeah. other types of products already, but not yet for the DNN. That's yeah, no, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. So the whole notion of the Prime program, as I mentioned, is to make sure that anyone across any of the products can use it. So, um, you know, if you are a Kayako customer, you can actually pull over and, and use ZNN. So it will be both ways. So when, when we're talking to the customers of the other side, we, we certainly talk about the, the benefits of the DNN platform. Uh, and then I guess just to reiterate on your first point on the, on the partner side of it, I would, again, highly encourage uh, everyone in here to to go on to the, the new partner program. We, we revised it, because the old partner program was, was I, I think, a little strange. It tended to be really be an evoke uh, partner program as opposed to a community partner program, and I think that was one mistake. And then two, I think that it was also being monetized uh, from a fees perspective, and I think that's, all, that's also a mistake. I mean, that's, that's in there for the end customers to be able to look at that and then say, hey, do I want to choose DNN versus others? Who can I connect with and partner with and things like that? So we want to make it inclusive, uh, and that's why we reduce the fees as well as included you know, everyone within that. Um, 
However, we you still want to make sure that there is delineation on who's a really, really active partner versus the ones that are not, and that's why there's some type of segmented tiers. But in all, all scenarios, uh, well, you know, we should make it, it sounds like it might be a little bit hard to sign up still, but we still, we should reduce that friction, but certainly everyone should be encouraged. And we should even look at the list of people that are here that aren't yeah. on it, and then yeah. follow back up with everyone. Yeah. Good, good idea, good idea. Um, so I'm gonna take one more question, and then we're gonna round up for lunch. So, uh, Darren. Can we expect the uh, features in Evoke to converge with those in platform? Can we expect the features in Evoke to converge with those in platform is the question. Can, in other words, can we see all of that stuff go down into platform? Sure. So um, the current business model is still based on segmentation. So my ex expectation is that you know, there will still be some features that are in Evoke that people are paying a bunch of money for versus the platform. Uh, now, will that change over time and it become more like an Acquia model that's based on support? Maybe. Uh, but in the near term, what we're doing is, is making sure that the, be the baseline platform features are, uh, are intelligent and up to date. Right? Because I believe that it has been over segmented in time. And, you know, Mitch and I were just talking about it, like things like the cloud uh, capabilities, for example. And, like, that shouldn't be a segmentation, guys. It should be able to work on both, or the, the data structure side of the world. And that should be across both. So, um, in the near term, we're going to have to intelligently look at those pieces. So I wouldn't say everything from a vote comes down, otherwise there is no paid business in that particular case. Um, but at the same hand, I don't want to um, uh, de-feature the platform, which is kind of what it felt like it's been being done today. So uh, some features have been talked about in the ground. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and, then they, and they will continue to be, yeah. right? And, and we'll time to time we do that. Right. Every couple of years, we send a lot of features. Yeah. Is there a road? Yeah, is there a roadmap for Evoke? Uh, there's question. certainly a roadmap for Evoke, but as far as the features that are going to be coming down into the platform, I think that's something that that we're working on. Is like, well, what what needs to be there from just a baseline? Uh, intelligent, modern platform perspective, and how do we uh, make sure we get there? But also, you know, similar to what Mitch mentioned, we, you know, I think across the board, we also want to uh, uh, reduce the footprint and also, you know, make it as most modern as possible, so that we can make the the transition to to .NET Core in, in the easiest way. And so it's not, you know, hey, let's just throw a bunch of features in there either. So uh, it has to be intelligently done uh, to be um, to be modern um, yet. Uh, yet still have that segmented business in the near term. So, as a follow-up to Andy, is that a public roadmap that's available for a uh, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it, it certainly should be. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm completely fine with, with publishing the, the Evoke roadmap over time. It, it needs to make sense, uh, again, with the platform roadmap and what have you. But there's there's nothing in that that keeps us from doing that. Now it is a paid product, so there will be some uh, length of time that you want to go on the public versus versus the NDA version. But there's no reason why we can't publish the uh, the near term version of it. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. I to yeah. Uh, We're talking about how can we improve things here. What what we need to do. My suggestion would be try to revamp one thing that was there a long time ago was, was the, the suggestions or the ideas model, I don't even remember what the name. Put there on a central place that is very visible, not sure even on the home page, where everybody knows what people, what users really need. And that means developers, that means end users, that means partners, that means everyone. A place where people can go, vote for things, and, and that could be also a way of assembling the community on doing things. Where the attention is, is where you get, we will get traction. That's something that we should be uh, Clint, you want to react to that? So the, the, the suggestion is to revamp the old, um, what is it called? The ideas module. The ideas, ideas, the ideas, the ideas module, module or something, or something. The, yeah. The, the way of doing this yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, so it's a great point as far as like the code base of the module. I'm not sure like how current it is. Um, yeah, right. no, I mean, that's an evoke feature, right? It's part of Engage. That was the module that was put in there. And the reason I think it was taken out was last year or so, because, you know, we have the answers area where people are asking questions. We have forum, 
and we have ideas. And we're actually not able to focus on the ideas. So people were creating, sending these ideas. We're just not, they were just sitting there. We're not able to, because we're focusing in different way as a business, now that has changed, it makes sense to bring it back. It does make sense to bring it back, in my opinion, so that we can listen to the larger community, not just people in this room. They can participate in there and they can vote. I totally second your idea. I think we can bring that back. If you have a central place where, where the community can give, absolutely, and give, I think, and get some mass traffic into that, we can even think about the way of sponsoring things to be done. And yeah. sponsoring can be paying money or investing dollars. Uh, we have done that in the community, uh, and this store has had some great contributions based on people contributing the sponsoring things. Yeah, because you don't even know. You don't even know what people need, saw, right? So if, if you start to see some of those, then it gives you ideas for module developers to actually build some modules there as well, right? Not everything has to be in the platform right. or in Evoke, right? If there is a demand, then you know someone can monetize it. So, but you need to know what it is. So I think it's a great idea. So you follow up yeah, with? Yeah, we, uh, we, can, we can make it happen. I mean, yeah, I be, be online next week. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, can I make one, one comment? I, yeah. I, I want to just kind of paint a picture for everybody here, uh, draw, draw a parallel to where we are. Um, so I grew up with you know, two parents that had a lot of structure, you know, had to ask permission for things. And when they dropped me off at college, it took about two days for me to realize if I want to go to the store, I don't have to ask for it. I just go do it. And so I felt this sense of freedom and it didn't take long. And that's where we are in DNN. We, we have been conditioned over the past however many years to just sit back and releases come to us, right? We don't have to do much. We just download the release and you got the new features. Well, that's not where we are anymore. We have been dropped off at college and we have this freedom, but don't do drugs. Pe yeah. <laughs> yeah, but don't, don't do anything crazy. And don't act up so I mean, pe people are realizing, some people have realized it early, where other people, it takes longer. Uh, so I, I just want to, I want everybody to, to leave here feeling empowered and that you, you now have this new sense of freedom to, if you want something, then just go do it. All right. Thank you. Um, myself, you know, I didn't contribute anything to the platform, and I definitely would. However, you know, I want to know what the 99% of people want to see in the platform for right. the best time. Well, that's yeah, that's, that's what the point uh, yeah, BSS yeah. was alluding to as well. Yeah. So thank you very, very much for this session. I know we did not have enough time to answer all of the burning questions you have. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, the whole panel for being here uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, answering, answering your questions. Feel free to ask us uh, over lunch if you have any questions. Thank you.